Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, the Senate Majority Leader outlines the Republican budget priorities and principles, and lawmakers describe measures to eliminate poverty and raise taxes on electric vehicles, plus efforts to increase civics awareness and ban private prisons. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. The shared goal of state policymakers is to make Minnesota a better place to live, but approaches to achieving this end differ. Joining me to offer the vision of the Senate Republicans is Senate Majority Leader Paul Gazelka. Thank you for being here. Back again. Uh, you recently announced four budget principles that will guide your caucus in crafting our state's next two-year budget. The first idea was that of taking care of people. So what does that entail? So it's, it's uh, an emphasis on compassion as one of the things we should look at. So certainly some of the things that we provide for people generally, the elderly, uh, the disabled, uh, vulnerable children, we're not going to forget them when we put a budget together. But it's also protecting the taxpayer. It's also things like opportunity scholarships for kids in failing schools. How do we, with our conservative values, reflect also that we're caring for people. So that's one of our four pillars. Now, some of those things that are involved in caring for people cost money. Will you pull from resources that are already being directed elsewhere, or, or is it just just in general that's what you're after? Well, it's an in general pillar, uh, because right now we, we provide a lot of benefits for the people I mentioned. Uh, but like failing schools and kids having an opportunity to go somewhere else is not a big cost. It's, that one, frankly, is, is a private sector helping contribute and allowing those kids to go somewhere else. So you can still have uh, things that care for people, but conservative ways that doesn't always mean you spend more money to do it. The second tenet you spoke of is protecting the taxpayer by living within our means. Is your goal then to craft the budget just using the money that's already coming into the state's coffers or are there tax pr cut proposals involved? How, what does that mean? Uh, we'll likely have some tax cut proposals, but it, it mostly is living within our means. Uh, there is a surplus. It's not a huge number when you figure out the overall budget, but certainly enough that we should be able to make all of our priorities. So the governor's proposing a number of tax increases. That's not protecting the taxpayer. We're in the top five tax states. We, I'd like to be out of the top 10. Uh, and so that's where there'll be some tug of war between us and the governor. Uh, last fall, the American Society of Civil Engineers gave our state's roads a D-plus rating. On the campaign trail, Governor Walls uh, spoke openly of the need to increase the gas tax, and then he cites his election as a kind of mandate for doing that. You have very clearly said the state does not need to raise the gas tax. So considering the state of our roads and bridges, how would you like to invest in that infrastructure? So in the last two year cycle, we did take half of the sales tax on auto parts. That now goes to roads and bridges. So that will start uh, improving our roads. Plus we took a half a billion dollars in the last two years of bonding money and put that towards roads and bridges, Highway 23, Highway 252, Highway 14. We, we emphasize that. That was the path we were on. Uh, the governor wants to do away with that one and raise the gas tax from 28 cents to 48 cents, you know, almost double, plus uh, tab fee increase, plus increase on the tax when you buy a newer used car. And so we don't think you need to do that. We did it the last two years without raising taxes, and so we think we should continue on that path. In a press release uh, related to the press conference where you talked about these, these uh, pillars, it was pointed out that there's been a 39% growth in the general fund over the last eight years. You've said that controlling spending is essential. So how can you accomplish the controlling spending piece? By not raising taxes. If you raise taxes, then you're going to increase spending more than you need to do. And it's not easy. I don't care who's in power. It doesn't matter whether it's Republican or Democrat. Government, by nature, just wants to grow. And so it's hard to say no. Uh, but if you don't say no, it, it, it gets out of control. And 39% over an eight-year period, even putting inflation in there, even population growth is way too much because it forces us then to raise taxes again. And if we have a downturn, which sooner or later is going to happen, then, the then it's almost a crisis. And we've experienced that before. 
your caucus has put forth significant effort in holding government entities accountable. Uh, for example, uh, recent fraud in child care centers or looking into the troubles with the Minnesota licensing and registration system, MinLARS, mm -hmm. just to name a few. Uh, there have also been efforts in committee to streamline government services. What more still needs to be done in terms of making government accountable? Well, first of all, that's one of the other ways we can control spending, too. Uh, the biggest thing is that we form uh, a connection to the governor where we both agree on a problem and then roll up our sleeves and try to fix it. And I, I want to give the governor um, the benefit of the doubt here. I think he also wants to fix Minlars. We have new commissioners. He is more engaged in why it's not working. And so that's part of the solution, that it's not just the, the uh, legislative branch, it's the executive branch too. And I, I think we're going to see some of that this session. That would be really good for Minnesota if we're all kind of working towards the same goal. Governor Wall's proposed budget came out recently and in your initial response, I'm quoting you, you said, this first budget is the kind of budget you get when you promise everyone everything. So I think you, you were, there was a bit of shock, I think, at that moment. You've had some time to reflect on the governor's budget. Beyond the principles you've laid out, what do you think is important maybe in relation to what he's laid out. So I, I did say that. Um, I, I, that quote is after I looked at it for 30 minutes and saw that it was over a $3 billion tax increase, it was like, this is, this you can't, it's impossible to do this, but if you promise everybody, eventually everybody gets less than what they wanted. And we, I want to lower expectations as far as promising everybody, and that's I guess why I was so bold. I also said we'd become a cold California, but yes. that was it was just it was so large that it was just like, you know, we can't we can't do this if we, if we expect to live within our means. And so so we'll all focus on the things that we're talking about, transportation, uh, the tax conformity bill, we're gonna figure out that one, and making sure that we care for people in the process. But it it was very, very large. Finally, uh, the governor also uh, this week released his capital investments proposal, uh, so one point, about $1.3 billion. Should there be a bonding bill this year? Well, not one of that size. I said that maybe we'll look at that one for next year. Uh, in the non-bonding year, the, the budget year, normally you have a small bonding bill that takes care of just things that, that came up that you have to just deal with. Uh, that normally is in the $200 million range. So $1.2 billion, that would be I think bigger than any one we've ever done, uh, but it's not uncommon for the non-budget year, so every other year, a billion dollar bonding bill, somewhere in that number. And so, you know, we'll take a look at it, but I, I'm pretty certain that uh, we're, we're not gonna do that the same year that we have to grapple with the budget. But perhaps a smaller bonding bill, would you would be in favor of? Well, for, for little things, I, I have some openness, so we'll see. I mean, like, like I said, some things can't wait two years. Uh, if somebody can make the case and convince all of us, we'll consider it. But small is the most we would do. Leader Kazaka, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. A bipartisan coalition of lawmakers plus educational and civic leaders advocated for a bill that would increase high school students' civic understanding. Former uh, Su Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor decries civics education in America as a crisis. House File 249 requires that civics be offered as a course for credit to juniors or seniors in the state of Minnesota. It places civics under the world's best workforce, including uh, an exper experiential learning provision. In other words, there, there's part of this bill that you can learn by doing. You know, students can be given assignments to be election judges and, and uh, you know, participate in, in a campaign, things like that. Uh, it also has a provision where school districts are asked to report the civics test results. Right now, this test is required to be taken, but uh, it's in some places it may not be, uh, we just don't know. The strength of our democracy is based upon its citizenry. And the key thing is that our citizens be engaged, they understand how their government works, 
In Minnesota, we're better than most, and in some cases, we're better than all. No one is more fond of reciting the statistic than I am, that Minnesota is number one in the country in voter turnout and voter engagement, which is great. But in some ways, beyond just voting, our country is coming apart. And many of our civic institutions are shrinking, and our connections with one another are diminishing. This bill can help to weave us together. Civics education currently suffers from malnutrition, and we need to restore it to health. Proper civics education is the key ingredient to a society. I'm going to elaborate on what the Secretary of State said. It's not just educating voters. It's educating citizens. Because the definition of civics is the study of the rights and duties of citizens. I care about this country. And we have been lackadaisical in raising and educating good citizens. And we are paying the price today. It is the duty, it's the only duty in the Minnesota State Constitution of the legislature. A Republican form of government dependent upon the intelligence of the people, it is the duty of the Minnesota legislature to create a general and uniform system of public schools. And add a little semicolon there and say, citizenship class required their junior or senior year. Ten years ago, a bipartisan commission issued a report with the goal of ending poverty by 2020. To date, the benchmarks set forth in that document have not been met. Senator John Marty co-chaired that commission a decade ago and joins me to talk about renewed efforts. Thank you for being here. Pleasure to be with you. Let's start with the historical context. In 2007, the Legislative Commission on Ending Poverty by 2020, a bipartisan coalition, began meeting. What was the impetus then? It was actually a group of faith leaders, uh, Christian, Jewish, Muslim leaders, came together and something like 70 or 40 religious leaders signed a statement that we believe it was a common foundation. All of their religions said we're supposed to care about other people and that we as a society ought to be caring for those who are struggling. And so they came together and made a pitch for this and the legislature some legislators who aren't here anymore carried a bill that would create a commission on how can we end poverty in Minnesota. They created it so it was equal numbers of both parties on it. It was half House, half Senate members. Um, so it was a very nice mix. I think it was, a, obviously people aren't going to agree on everything, but at least I think what we did was map out a road map. If we want to end poverty by 2020, how do we make that happen? They gave us 11, 12 years to do it. and and we were hopeful that more would happen. And presumably one of the reasons why not, not much happened was the Great Recession, which kind of derailed everything. Here we are, 2019, a relatively stable economy. There's once again a package of proposals that you're spearheading in the Senate to push the reset button. So let's start with the minimum wage. What do you propose there? Sure. What we're proposing is something that's along the lines of what Minneapolis and St. Paul and a few other communities and states around the country have done. We're proposing a several year phase up to a $16 an hour minimum wage. That's significant. I don't think you could do it right now without a lot of difficulty, but significant jumps. A year, a dollar and a half an hour for the next two years, and then a dollar an hour for the few years after that. Because it's just under $10 an hour now we'd raise it by a total of just over $6 over the next four years. So that's one way of tackling poverty is, is higher wages. If Another people make more money, yes, they're less likely to be in poverty because poverty in, in essence is not having enough money to pay for housing and food and other necessities. Well, and another tenant then is, is to expand the working family tax credit. How does this help? Sure, even at $16 an hour, and we have a lower, rate for small for very small businesses but even at sixteen dollars an hour even if that took effect now that's not going to pull everybody out of poverty a lot of families based on family size and so on that's not going to be enough even if you have two working parents so what we're suggesting is increasing a very popular bipartisan tax credit it's a tax credit for low-income working people and a single parent with two kids who's making about twenty thousand a year by doubling this tax credit, more than doubling it, it should be somewhere in the range of one to $3,000 more in their pockets every year. And this is a very smart way. It's rewarding people who are not paid enough from their jobs, and it helps with that. So those two things together should really help a lot of parents bring themselves out of poverty. Yeah, so those two things would sort of work in tandem to right. raise the, the standard of living. 
You've also uh, indicated a proposal to eliminate the waiting list for the child care assistance program, as well as to raise the reimbursement rate, which has right. been talked about in the legislature. Right. We and have a child care shortage now. This proposal is also in Governor Wall's budget. How does increasing access to child care help reduce poverty? Sure. The governor would cut away half of the waiting list. Ours would permanently get rid of the waiting list because the program would be funded to the level necessary to provide it. So if you are, say you're on welfare and you're looking for a job, I found a job. When can you start? Well, as soon as I get child care arranged. Well, if child care, if you're on a waiting list, you might not get it for two years. Well, thanks a lot. It means you can't, you can't take the job you were just offered. So we want to have it so people don't have to wait for it and that they know when they're going off to work that their kids are in a secure place. I think child care is very important and it's something, it's a shortage all around the state. We have huge waiting lines in like Hennepin County, but there are places throughout the state are having trouble with it. And the reason for increasing the reimbursement rates, significantly increasing them, is right now the sliding fee program, which means that if you're a parent and you need child care and your income is too low to pay for it because it's so costly, um, we will, you'll have co-payments, you'll have your share of it based on your income and the state will put in the rest to fund it. But the level we're putting it in for right now is so low that a lot of child care providers can't afford to take students or take children in it and there's not much choice so you don't get to choose from better quality care for your kids. And finally, we have a lot of child care providers who are themselves living in poverty because the rates are so low. And so by increasing the rate, it also it helps improve the child care, helps them be able to survive, and makes the parents have more choice so their kids can be in safe, secure environments. One more element of your package is an increase in the Minnesota Family Investment Program grants called MFIP. What are these grants and how are they sure. useful in the context of, of helping families work and have a, a livable wage? Sure. All the first three things are dealing with people who are working, but still they're not making enough money. This one is adding to, to people who are between jobs, people who can't find work, people because of their health or their kids' health or conditions may not be able to work. And our society's always said we care about this, but those grants have not gone up for over 30 years. I mean, they may have been reasonable in 1986, but they're not reasonable anymore. And so we're increasing those grants by $300. The governor is proposing a $100 increase. There's a Senate Republican member who has proposed a $200 increase. So we think, I mean, we'd be happy to see any change because it's been stuck for so long. But you find out if parents have enough money that they're not worried about. You know, that extra $300 a month means they don't, run out of food as early in the month as they do. They're trying to pick up food at food shelves and other places, but you know they can only do so much. And this really helps reduce the stress on a parent and their kids. So it's, it's a wonderful thing for addressing poverty. And that's the one provision that would help the people between jobs and so on. And there's a five-year cap on how long you can be on the MFIP program. And so these are people who are, many of them have been on it for six months here. and few months there, but during those months, they need more money. None of these proposals is inexpensive. Do these anti-poverty initiatives require tax increases? We think we should pay for some. When you propose a program, it's honest to pay for it. So we are proposing this, we put these all into their individual bills, we also put them in a package, and we propose to pay for it with a, I'd call it closing a loophole. Social Security tax, as everybody knows, we all pay 6.2% of our income up to $132,900 or something. Everybody pays it's a flat tax, 6.2% of all your earned income, just your wage income, and then it stops. So it's a flat tax, except for those who are making more than that. People making $300,000 a year, they're not paying a penny more in tax than somebody who's making $130,000 a year. And we're saying, well, if the federal government isn't going to take that money, we should impose that tax instead. So it becomes a flat tax, so everybody's paying the same, and that provides enough money to more than fund these programs. And we think this is fairness, it's economic justice. Um, I think if you take a poll, and we've seen a poll, the only one I've seen on this nature was a poll, a national one, about 10, 15 years ago, that said that, do you believe that somebody who's working full-time ought to make enough money that they're not living in poverty. 
that they have enough money for basic needs. 94% of the population agreed. It was like 1% or 2% disagreed. It was overwhelming. It was consensus. We as a society believe if you go out and work and you do your best, you ought not be living in poverty. And unfortunately, the poverty commission, we saw people all around the state who were working hard, working two part-time jobs. That's all they could find. And they were making minimum wage or not enough to make ends meet. And we think that the public expects us to take care of each other that way. They expect us to help people get on their own feet. Senator Marty, thank you. My pleasure. House Majority Leader Ryan Winkler and Senator Ron Latz were joined by correctional officers at the Capitol to promote a bill that would ban the state from housing inmates in facilities not owned and operated by the state. We should be about taking care of the people who are doing the work in our prisons, the corrections officers who are here with us today, uh, who put their um, professional commitment towards rehabilitation, corrections, and safety in our prison system. That is the record of public prisons and uh, jails in Minnesota, and that is what we will continue to do uh, as a legislature. We are not going to go down the path of private prisons which put profits in front of public safety. When profits are the number one goal of operating a business, uh, corners get cut. Um, and it's easy to cut corners in the correctional system if that's your motivation. Uh, and we've seen the effect of that around the country um, in other states where they've had private prisons. Um, and uh, the fact is they're not safer. They are less safe for the correctional officers as well as for the inmates. Um, they don't deliver the kind of services that a correctional system should. I mean, by name, in Minnesota, we are aptly called a correctional system because a primary goal of our system is to correct bad behavior. It's time to end the uh, concept that anybody should pro um, profit off of incarcerating human beings. As the legislature ponders whether or by how much to raise the gas tax to pay for roads and bridges, a bill that would increase the surcharge on electric vehicles and establish a surcharge on hybrid vehicles has been considered in the Senate Transportation Committee. The bill's author, Senator Jeff Howe, joins me now. Welcome. Oh, great to be here. As it stands now, electric vehicle owners pay $75 for a surcharge. That money goes to the Highway User Tax Distribution Fund. Your bill would increase the charge to $250 for electric vehicles and establish a surcharge for hybrid vehicles of $125. Why the change? Well, I, uh, I just looked at myself and how much I drive. I drive about 20,000 miles a year. And uh, if you figure that my vehicle gets about 20 miles on the average, 20 miles to the gallon, that would be 1,000 gallons of fuel. Take that times Point, the 28 and a half cents that we currently pay, that's $285. Now, if you take the average Minnesotan, arguably dependent upon whose numbers you use, is about 17,000 miles a year. Take that, uh, the average miles per gallon is about 23. I can't remember exactly what that is. It's about 600 gallons or so, give or take. Take that times the 28 and a half cents, it's about 210. Well, so we're right in the ballpark. Uh, that's why when you look at it, I decided that they weren't paying. $75 isn't enough. Uh, when you're driving a hybrid, I talked to, I actually got an email after this bill was introduced, and the email depicted she drew, drove an SUV and switched to a hybrid. Puts on about 21,000 miles a year. She figured she was saving about 240 dollars in gas tax a year. So I'm not looking to penalize these folks, just want to make a fair comparison about they should be paying their fair share. So we're talking about equity between those who drive combustion engines and those who drive electrics or hybrid vehicles. During the committee, you and Senator Scott Dibble, who is a DFL and often opposed to things like this, actually agreed that really the most equitable solution would be for taxation on kilowatt hours but our state doesn't have that, that infrastructure to do that. So if we're moving towards electric cars, 
in the long run, should we begin to establish this infrastructure to make taxation more fair? Well, that's a decision point we need to make. This is an easy way to do it. We don't need the infrastructure. It's quick, it's easy. The problem, but I agree. I mean, it should be as easy as going into a parking ramp, putting in your credit card, picking your, which one you're plugged into, how many kilowatt hours you wanna charge your vehicle, and just we collect the fees right there, but that takes infrastructure. Now, is that how we want to do this? Or are we going to do, are we going to charge by weight? We could do a weight figure. We could do uh, miles driven. There's a whole lot of different avenues we could go. I just want to start the conversation. What's the right way? What direction does Minnesota want to go on making this a fair and equitable process to collect the equivalent? of the gas tax to all users. So you mentioned weight, and that is another aspect because these electric vehicles weigh significantly more than their counterparts, and heavier vehicles take greater tolls on our roads. Absolutely. If we as a society are moving towards electrification of vehicles, are we gonna have to spend more for infrastructure in maintaining our roads because we have all these heavy vehicles running around? Take, absolutely, when you take a look, we're actually receiving buses in our transit facilities that are gonna run on electricity, on batteries. They are gonna be significantly heavy. And if you can do that with a bus and the transit, you know that the semi-trucks are gonna be right behind that. They are gonna be significantly heavier. So we, somebody actually brought that up that we should do this on a weight process instead of getting your license tab fees on valuation we should adjust that and do it on weight and then you wouldn't get the break as your vehicle got older you would get it on no matter how old your vehicle was you'd get it on weight so like I say there's a num number of different ways to mm -hmm. do this we just need to figure out and there's a lot of people out there under the misnomer that electric vehicles and hybrids are lighter than their counterparts not true at all. Take a Honda Accord. The difference between a hybrid and the standard, the hybrid Honda Accord is going to weigh almost 500 pounds more. So, One last question. Um, yes. We hear anecdotal stories about people who do drive these electric and hybrid, and they get to charge their cars for free. The rest of us are paying for gas. Uh, it seems unfair, but there is the argument that these people are actually paying their fair share because their cars cost more, so they're paying higher sales tax and they're high, paying higher registration fees. Do you buy that? So if we're gonna do that, then the people that are driving BMWs and Mercedes, get, they, they sh should get a rebate on their, on their gas tax? I, I don't see, to me, if that's a choice you make, just like you make a choice to ride, drive a BMW compared to a Chevy or Ford, that's a decision you make and, and so I, I firmly believe that that's a failing argument. Senator Howe, I want to thank you so much. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.